am I speaking clearly? That is, seriously, I, I don't want to speak too slowly and boringly, but I also don't want to be racing along at a pace that leaves people bewildered. And uh, if anything isn't clear, first of all, please interrupt and ask questions. But second of all, I'm asking at the outset, I, I, are, are we c communicating? <laughs> Is anyone? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Please, would you switch off your cell phones? <laughs> uh, okay. So I hope you all have the diagram in front of you. And I'd like to call our attention to it because, uh, of course, after that exegetical background, we need to finally get to the Noachide Covenant. What is it? And before considering the various other components that uh, ornament the page, I think it may be most helpful for us to consider what they are. And so we go through the list. <coughs> a prohibition on murder, a prohibition on idolatry, and I'm going to specifically define that as meaning, deifying what is not divine. Perhaps idolatry itself is a poor translation. The expression that is characteristic in our parlance in Hebrew is avodah zara, which means alien service. Idolatry carries the connotation of bowing down to a little statue. Obviously, we imply by avodah zara, by alien service, something that may be far more sophisticated than that, but nonetheless, that constitutes deifying what is not divine. A prohibition, number three, on sexual immorality. Number four, a prohibition on theft. Number five, a prohibition on blasphemy, where, again, a definition is in order. By blasphemy, we mean cursing God in God's name. And finally, a prohibition on eating a limb that is taken from a living animal. The seventh is the establishment of courts, of a legal system to enforce the other six. Now, at this point, of course, you already know, after our survey of the exegetical background, that the answer to the obvious, where is this written, is, of course, in a word, Nowhere. <laughs> Not in the Bible. It is, as you may note in the, uh, the antecedents of the Noachide Laws, something that we do find in our tradition recorded in the Talmud, recorded in the Midrash, codified in the codes of Halakha, for example, by Rabbi Moses Maimonides. And one additional dimension that I do feel compelled to share with you, even though I don't think it's my business, is very likely, perhaps, the subject of the laws to which James refers in Acts chapter 15. I don't think that's my business. <laughs> That's your business. But you're welcome to. But, um, <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I, must, I must note in this regard that I am beholden in particular to one of the, the great luminaries of Torah scholarship of the 18th century, Rabbi Jacob Emden, who in an essay that he published in 1757, and reissued in a somewhat expanded form in 1758. An, es an essay, I should stress, that is, to the best of my knowledge, without parallel anywhere in rabbinical literature, in that it quotes copiously from Christian scripture. His name again, please? Rabbi Jacob Emden. Emden. Okay. Part of his life, he lived in a town of which you may have heard called Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> so again, Rabbi Emden, in his analysis 
proposes that it is indeed to the Noachide covenant that James is referring, that he refers explicitly to selections from this list and implicitly refers to them all as the commandments that are to be imposed upon the Gentile world because the Jews come into the synagogues every Sabbath and hear the Torah of Moses read and they are charged with keeping the gamut of the commandments. Th that bifurcation is something that I'd like to address more in the third part of our afternoon today. But um, when we consider what the significance of these laws is, in particular after recognizing that they are not explicitly identified in the text, I think there is an underlying structure that I have attempted in my own humble way to color code here. And um, you may recall in this regard the reference to the cardinal sins that we saw way back at the beginning of our discussion. Murder, idolatry, or again, to employ the general engaging in alien service, and sexual immorality. Well, of course, one cannot fail to note that all three of them are on this list. In the order that I've presented them, they are one, two, and three, respectively. But besides the realization that they are all on this list, and likewise, as we noted in chapter 6 of Genesis, in verse 11, the crime of theft, which on this list is, of course, number four, there is, I believe, a more essential pattern that we should note that pertains to the top part of the page here. And that is recognizing that the essential components of life can be summarized in three realms. The world inside, the world outside, and the meaning beyond them both. Which I realize is a very oblique way of describing what we could summarize then as self, others, and God. Most specifically, our responsibilities to self, others, and God. And the implications then with respect to the sort of lives that we are enjoined to live in the context of our responsibilities to self, to others, and to God. I feel compelled to explain the next line here in the diagram, which I must admit comes also not from any scriptural source, but in fact is an encapsulation of one of the oldest post-biblical statements in our tradition. Specifically, in the Mishnah, in Ethics of the Fathers, after we read of the progression in the first paragraph, the first Mishnah, that brings us to the men of the Great Assembly, a period that hovers over the end period of the Hebrew Bible, in that in our tradition, the men of the Great Assembly was a body convened by Ezra, we read in the second Mishnah, the second paragraph, of Simon the Just, Shimon HaTzadik, who was from the last remnants of the Great Assembly, who, in our tradition, was the high priest that succeeded, succeeded either directly or <coughs> eventually, the priesthood of Ezra himself who tells us in the Mishnah that bears his name that the world stands on three things. Those three things being the Torah, Avodah, which translates to service and in context means serving God, and Gemilut Chasadim, that is active loving kindness. I submit that it should be transparent to us all that in identifying these three pillars of life, we are in fact identifying the three essential components 
that underlie our responsibilities in life. That is, that serving God pertains to our relationship to God is obviously axiomatic. That engaging in active loving kindness, which is the manner in which we behave toward our fellow human beings, and not only human beings, is of course expressive of our relationship to others. It is perhaps less obvious why I consider Torah to address one's relationship with self, but then when we consider what essentially Torah is teaching, having already noted that the word Torah means teaching, Torah is teaching us how to live. Personally, I like to describe Torah as a user's manual. When you get your car, you get a user's manual to operate your car. Don't you think you should get a user's manual when you get life? So the user's manual to life is the Torah. It is then, in that vein, the guidebook to self-refinement, to self-actualization. And the pillar of Torah then pertains to relationship to self. Now the reason that I think it's important for us to consider, yes, please. I don't know. Any, any, and it, I, I'm guessing it may be simply an artifact of a, um, a systemic error that has crept into translations. But if anyone has historical insights onto that subject, I would be fascinated by uh, finding out because I, I feel it's, frankly, so insidious. <laughs> Even if it was completely inadvertent, it, it, uh, it has such. Uh, I think it's because of the translation in Greek nomos. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. And Nomos has, I think, at least five ways of uh, explaining Torah. I see. Okay. There, well, there we have it. And the Septuagint is Torah translated by Nomos? Always? Nearly almost. Always, yes. Mm -hmm. Nearly always. I see. Okay. It, it is true that Torah can have the meaning of law, as in a particular domain within the corpus of Torah. Mm -hmm. When we read, for example, this is the Torah of a particular offering brought in the temple, that it is the laws that pertain to that offering. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's not the meaning of the word Torah. That's a borrowed sense that is based upon the, the core meaning, which is teaching. But in, in any case, returning to our progression here, I think this three-way division of the components of life, which is admittedly simplistic and schematic, as all divisions usually are, is particularly helpful in our understanding the nature of the Noahide laws. Because upon reflection, of course, we realize that the three cardinal sins, murder, alien service, idolatry, and sexual immorality, are indeed respect respectively violations of these three pillars. I must note that here again, I am beholden to a source I mentioned earlier, Rabbi Judah Liva of Prague, the Maharal of Prague, one of the great Jewish thinkers of the 16th century, who indeed stresses this correspondence in his commentary on the statement of Simon the Just to which we just referred. That is, obviously, the realization that if one of the pillars of life is active loving kindness, giving to another, there is no more ruthless negation of that pillar than taking a person's life. That's murder. And of course, likewise, in the Hebrew, it is glaringly obvious that if one of the pillars is avodah, service, then its ultimate negation is avodah, zara, alien service, which is idolatry. And as for the third pillar, well, at this point, what might otherwise have seemed a somewhat elusive correspondence should be more obvious. And that is, once we recognize that Torah is the pathway of self-refinement, then inevitably its ultimate negation is the ultimate act of self-debasement. Inasmuch as the drives and passions of human beings are the means through which 
we are summoned to scale the heights of holiness, imbuing our lives with meaning, taking those passions, and instead of elevating them to a human and ultimately godlike level, using them to behave like animals is the ultimate negation of Torah. So there is no more glaring negation of Torah than that which is encompassed by sexual immorality. The three cardinal sins corresponding to the th three pillars. And indeed, as Rabbi Judah Leva of Prague aptly expresses it, violating any of these is tantamount to yanking out one of the pillars upon which the world stands. Of course, by world here, we mean merely a colorful metaphor for your life. A violation of any of these three is a negation of your very life. And so while if one is <coughs> acting under duress, we have a general principle that when one acts under compulsion, one is pardoned, but still and all, with respect to these cardinal sins, we are indeed enjoined if faced with the choice of death or violating any one of them to choose death. Because living by violating one of these three isn't living anymore. It isn't life if one of the essential pillars of life has been negated. So these three then, of course, constitute the direct negations of these three pillars, hence, of course, um, conveniently color-coded. <laughs> the... And, uh, so the sixth point, no, not eating... Wait, I haven't gotten to the... the second, I've only discussed the first three subs so far. Okay. Give me one moment. Yes? If um, both uh, uh, general rules, as mentioned, uh, rules, uh, should be considered by the entire humanity, um, but if Torah is part of these seven rules, how do you view Torah uh, in regard to uh, humanity? I want to stress here, Torah is not one of the rules. I'm, using, I'm merely employing Torah as the guidebook to self-actualization to understand whence this list comes. But indeed, this list, I should stress, and I'm going to stress, is not predicated upon the presumption that you can access them through Torah or that you even need to access them through Torah. But I want, to, I want to expand upon that a little bit later. That is, uh, I think that's a critically important point that pertains inevitably to understanding what this set of obligations is intended to invoke. But first, just to complete the list, so we see then that the first three, murder, alien service, or idolatry, and sexual immorality, are respectively the negations of these pillars of concern with respect to others, with respect to God, and with respect to self. And we consider the second threesome as a more subtle, but nonetheless emphatic negation of the, these three pillars as well. That is, that theft, like murder, is a negation of one set of responsibilities with respect to others. What in the parlance of Simon the Just is active loving kindness, should of course be clear. And we already noted this point, of course, in considering Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. That is, the generation of the flood was not beset by rampant murder, or they would have self-destructed, but it was beset by theft. By taking, instead of giving to another, instead of recognizing one's responsibilities to others, to negate those responsibilities, by wanton taking. Likewise, when we consider the more subtle but nonetheless substantive negation of the pillar that pertains to our relationship with God, so in the first threesome, it is, after all, alien service, idolatry. In the second threesome, it is blasphemy. Now, there's something that it's, it's critical for me to stress with respect to both of these. And that is, so, to what extent do the Noahide laws demand of 
those who affirm them affirmative belief in God. In the interest of full disclosure, I have to admit that there are different views on the subject, but um, only one to which I personally subscribe. So I'm going to only present it. <laughs> that is, I do have colleagues who will um, uh, affirm that there is an implicit belief in God in this system, and I must admit that I see no evidence of that whatsoever. The prohibition on alien service, on idolatry, is again, as stated, a prohibition on deifying what is not divine. There's no <laughs> affirmative mandate to deify God, to admit God's dominion. Likewise, blasphemy is prohibited because, upon reflection, blasphemy, in a sense, amounts to absurdity. Cursing God in God's name. If one believes in God, one should not be cursing him. If one doesn't, one should not be cursing in his name. So the absurdity of that bankrupting of one's spirituality in blasphemy is likewise a more attenuated, a more subtle expression of a negation of the, pil of, of the pillar of service, of our set of responsibilities with respect to that which is beyond our lives. And finally, the prohibition on eating a limb taken from a living animal. Inevitably, we recognize that the two most powerful physical drives. Excuse me, I just lost you. Could you just repeat the, the summary of what you just said before? Could I repeat what I just said? Of course not. I have no idea, but I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> that is, uh, in the same vein, that theft is the more subtle, more attenuated negation of the pillar of active loving kindness of one's responsibilities with respect to the other, so too the prohibition on blasphemy, on cursing God in God's name, is the more subtle, more attenuated negation of the pillar of service of one's responsibilities with respect to that which is beyond, the transcendent in life, God. Yes, but then you continue to explain um See, I'm, I'm deliberately using the more amorphous, transcendent, that which is beyond, instead of speaking about God per se, because again, I will maintain that the Noachide Covenant does not affirmatively require believing in God, but it does require not negating one's attitude with respect to the transcendent. If you will, to take a modern day um, parallel, uh, those who are familiar with the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous and other um, programs that in a similar vein are intended to redress social diseases to which people have succumbed. On the one hand, we'll undoubtedly discern in the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous an appeal to the transcendent, and yet simultaneously an assiduous avoidance of actually using God's name which personally I think was um, not only a, uh, a wise move in appealing to a broader audience, but also a move necessitated by the realization that there are many people who simply don't understand what we mean when we start talking about God. You know, there was a, um, a rabbi in Jerusalem around a generation ago who often engaged professed atheists in debate and when um, a atheists would protest, I don't believe in God, reportedly his, res his response would be, tell me about the God in whom you don't believe. I'm sure I don't believe in him either. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is that we live in a society in which words get bandied about in such a manner that we lose sight of what we actually mean by them. So hence, again, while as shorthand, I'm speaking of that pillar as pertaining to our responsibilities with respect to God, it doesn't need to actually be quantified per se in terms of God. I hope that's clear. Okay, and, um, and finally, the sixth prohibition about not eating a limb taken from a living animal, as we noted, the two overwhelming physical drives that animate 
human beings, indeed, that animate animals generally, are the drive of self-preservation and the drive of species preservation, which of course are respectively eating and sexuality. To the extent that the drive that pertains to sexuality is less enmeshed in actual survival, the negation of one's relationship with self, self-growth, self-refinement in sexual immorality is the more severe, the more destructive. That is, in the list of the cardinal sins, that is part of our first threesome. But to the extent that just as sexual immorality amounts to the debasement of the God-likeness within us that enables us to take our physical drives and elevate them to a spiritual level, so to the debasement of our eating, which on the one hand can likewise be a framework, a context through which we express our devotion to God, its debasement by the unfettered animal act of eating a limb torn from a living animal, the grotesque cruelty that regards the world as simply existing for the satisfaction of my drives, of my pleasures, that likewise figures on the list of the Noahide laws. For that sake, you could also have uh, written it in, in green, didn't you? Um, as an act of love and kindness for the animals. Uh, I could have, except that would make sense if the prohibition would simply be tearing a limb from a living animal. And ironically, that's not the prohibition. The prohibition is eating the limb torn, torn from a living animal. <laughs> but you have to tear it before you can eat no, it. No, true. But, but I'm, I'm emphasizing here that while you're completely right that the act of cruelty is in itself a vulgarity that undoubtedly these laws should be training us to avoid generally, in as much as the prohibition pertains to the act of eating, just as in number three, the prohibition pertains to the act of sexuality, it's the way we relate to our drives, the way we relate to our passions, that is the direct object of the prohibition. So it's not relating to our responsibilities with respect to the rest of the world. That exists, undoubtedly, but as an archetypal prohibition, it is a prohibition with respect to the debasement of our drives and desires, treating ourselves as animals instead of taking those desires and elevating them to a more refined and ultimately godlike level. But it's because um, the covenant is so explicitly uh, protective of uh, the animals. God makes the covenant with the birds, with all these uh, animals that went into the ark, so it's so positive. Uh, it seems as if God defends creation and also the animals. So why not be polite? Uh, to the I think it's a wonderful idea. We should certainly be polite to the animals. But I'm going to note in this regard, and, and, and I have to admit that this too is something that can readily lend itself to a whole separate discussion. But in the Torah, it's not based on the, wait, wait, on the wait, but, 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 let, me, let me express the, 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 the paradigm here that um, we in contemporary Western society are very much oriented to thinking in terms of rights. Mm -hmm. And we look into the Torah, and of course, in Biblical Hebrew, what's the word for rights? Ah, oh, time's up, it was a trick question. <laughs> there is no word for rights. And the Torah is all about responsibilities, not rights. Zchut, in the sense of right, is a modern appropriation of a Talmudic term, but it doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible in that sense. <laughs> and tzedakah? Tzedakah is, a, is an act of charity or act of righteousness. But no, I mean, I, what I mean, what I mean by, right, by rights is to have the, uh, the irrigation of prerogatives that are due me, mm. such as in the American Declaration of Independence, the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right. Those are rights. And that conception, that, that construct of rights, is entirely foreign to the Torah. Mm. 
Mm. And, and a good example of that, actually, is that in contemporary Western society, <laughs> we are very much attuned to thinking about animal rights. Yeah. Well, in the Torah, we will seek in vain anything about animal rights. What we do find is laws that pertain to, in the Hebrew, tsa'ar ba'alei chayim the avoidance of the suffering, the anguish of living things. But that's not a right of the animal, it's a responsibility of the human being. And it makes, of course, all the difference because, you know, a right is something that can be waived. A responsibility is something that is inviolable. As another uh, case in point, in Western society, um, a uh, suspected criminal has the right to not engage in self-incrimination. In Torah law, it is the responsibility of the courts that an individual does not have the ability to make himself considered wicked. And therefore, of course, in Western society, while there is a right against self-incrimination, if a criminal chooses to incriminate himself, then his testimony is considered valid and binding to be used against him. Whereas in the education of Torah law, self-incrimination is null and void. It doesn't have any consequence because one has responsibility to oneself and incriminating oneself would be a violation of that responsibility. So, getting back to the subject here, I, I'll express the, the attitude with respect to the animal kingdom as our responsibilities. But that's not the responsibility that is invoked in number six. The responsibility invoked in number six is your responsibility to yourself to not debase your act of eating. Your responsibilities, indeed, with respect to the animal kingdom, with respect to the world in general, can be lesion. And I feel compelled to share with you here that the truth is, it's not really seven laws. That is, first of all, in the much more detailed redactions of all of the laws that are pursuant to these categories, there are a lot more than seven. Sorry, folks. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, on, on, the number six is also the kosher ruling uh, provide. provide. Uh, sorry? The kosher ruling is also on the number six. Uh, well, again, th th it, it, pertains, it pertains to the act of eating. That's true. But, uh, but obviously, again, not, not with, re with respect to the parameters that are enjoined in the laws of the Torah, which are on a very different plane than these. And we'll note further, it's important for us to appreciate with respect to this list. Number one, with respect to our attitude altogether vis-a-vis -vis the Noachide laws, and this is going to be a um, more direct object of discussion in the third part, the Noachide laws constitute not a ceiling, but a foundation. Everyone is welcome to express his or her devotion to God through additional acts of devotion, either taken from the laws of the Torah that obligate Israel, or, frankly, from elsewhere. One can find innumerable opportunities to express one's devotion to God. These are not, however, mere votive acts. These are obligations. And in understanding what they constitute in terms of obligations, it's important for us to see them as the imperatives that they are. Now, again, I'm going to reiterate, if we seek explicit biblical sources for these prohibitions, we will seek in vain. Of course, from my perspective, as a believer in both the revelation of the written Torah at Sinai and the oral tradition that we believe came with it, that doesn't trouble me in the slightest. I regard this as part of the tradition that God revealed to the world explicitly through Moses, implicitly, indeed, through all of the generations of humanity going back to the first human beings who engaged in a direct dialogue with God. Adam, Noah, the human beings who served as the beacon, the basis, the source of the initial revelations of God to the world. 
but what I do feel compelled to stress in this tabular format is the realization that what these laws constitute beyond the specifics of the prohibitions that they entail, beyond the level of obligations, is archetypes, attitudes. The invocation of a sense of responsibility with respect to these essential components of life. Relationship with self, relationship with others, relationship with that which is beyond. Which, of course, by shorthand, we will identify indeed as God. They represent the foundation, and this is a critical point of emphasis here, because these rules we regard as binding on all of humanity. Now, I, I remember a number of years ago a conversation that I had with a very dear friend, Karl von Ort, the, the founder of Christians for Israel, which he uh, commented to me, you Jews are always talking about the Noachide laws. I taught my children about the Ten Commandments. To which I responded, it's wonderful that you taught your children about the Ten Commandments because you believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You believe in all the words of the Torah. You believe in the story of the Exodus. When you read, I am God your Lord who brought you forth from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, you believe with every fiber of your being that those are the words of God. That's wonderful. But the Noachide laws aren't only for people like you. There are people who never heard of the Bible, and certainly never heard of the God of the Bible. And this again brings me back to my emphasis that the prohibition on idolatry, on alien service, and on blasphemy has nothing to do with affirmatively embracing belief in God. All these laws presume is a baseline <coughs> cognizance that life is essentially meaningful. And I submit in this vein that this provides us not merely with an insight into the Noahide Covenant, it also provides us with a crucial insight into what altogether is the essential difference between theism and atheism. Now, of course, the, uh, the common way of characterizing the difference is, do you believe in God or not? Well, I'd like to propose a definition of the difference between theism and atheism that doesn't use God's name at all. I have a reason for my agenda here. But I'll get to that in a moment. First, my definition. The difference between theism and atheism lies in the question, is life intrinsically meaningful or not? period. Of course, in that pithy phrase, perhaps the most important word to underline is intrinsic. I am fully cognizant that there are many atheists who dedicate their lives to many noble and altruistic goals. But to the extent that one posits that one's existence is a chance haphazard event, guided by no purposeful hand, necessarily, life remains intrinsically meaningless. Any meaning is extrinsic. It comes from outside. It does not inhere within life. For the theist, for one who believes that there is an intelligent creator who put us in this world, whether we know what the purpose was or not, that act of creation is the source of intrinsic meaning. Of course, as you can well imagine, and I, I kind of intimated this already, the reason for my alternative definition here is because the moment we start talking about God, we are liable to lose much of our audience. Because they don't know what we're talking about, and the truth is that all too often, even when believers talk about God, they don't know what they're talking about. But everyone knows what meaning means on some plane, and I want to stress that just as when we cast the definition in terms of belief in God versus non-belief in God, there is no proof that could possibly be summoned to demonstratively establish that God does or does not exist. When we cast the definition in terms of meaning, there is also 
no proof that could possibly be summoned to demonstratively establish whether life is or is not intrinsically meaningful. I do believe, and I have yet to be challenged on this score, that people do have a sense that their lives are meaningful. Obviously, the confirmed diehard atheist would posit that that is a reflection of an illusion. Okay, fine. Everyone is free to choose. Do you believe that that sense of meaning that you feel underlies your life is there because of illusion or because it reflects an underlying reality that you were created by God? Is there a proof here? Not that I can see. But again, returning to the Noachide laws, so you talk about atheists and then they, they, they disappear on you. But, um, <laughs> but to the extent that... Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, when your definition of intrinsic meaning is coming from an external source. Indeed. It is in the sense that if... So... No, it, it, what, you, what I understand you mean is my appeal to intrinsic meaning is to God. Ultimately, yeah. Not just ultimately, definitely. That is precisely the source of meaning. To the, to the extent that as long as life remains a closed, this worldly box, if I do not have any absolute source to which to appeal, I have not defended meaning. What makes my reference to God essentially distinct here is, again, whether one chooses to believe in God or not, remains one's own prerogative. But, when I talk about God, I'm talking about an absolute. No one can, in his right mind, claim that, it, that absolute meaning is to be found anywhere within the paltry parameters of this world. The only way that we can seek absolute meaning is by, the, by appealing to the beyond. But, but I think that, I think that maybe, I'm, I'm not an atheist, but I think if I was, I, I would say that you are arguing within a, a theist box. By all, all of your statements, I, I, I'm not being sensible to say that. I'm saying, yes, I am. I, I don't accept that I have to have your external reference to say my life is meaningful. I, I actually don't accept that premise is what I'm saying to you. And therefore, um, your premise is a theist premise. That's nothing to do with whether my life is meaningful. It's got to do with your starting point of your argument. And although you're saying I don't have to believe in God, you are saying, but ultimately there has to be a something to be logical. And I'm going, no, there doesn't. Well, I, I want to stress, I didn't say anything about logic here. And I don't think the, the, the criticism should come from the direction of that what I'm saying doesn't make sense. I think the criticism, and I freely plead guilty to this criticism, is that my argument is entirely self-referential. Indeed it is. My argument that there exists a source of absolute meaning is self-referential because it's predicated upon believing that there exists a source of absolute meaning. I don't believe that an atheist can invoke the, any reference to absolute meaning at all within the paltry bounds of this world simply because they don't exist. To say that because all that exists is this world, therefore that constitutes absolute meaning, I think is an even more glaring invocation yeah. of a self-referential set of semantics. In other words, it's saying, well, we're this is what I have, yeah. this becomes absolute. What's absolute yeah, here? As an atheist, yes, I would agree with you, we're both being self-referential. No, I, I agree I, with you, yes, okay, but, but I don't agree with you on, I, I, I think your argument makes absolute sense in this room, but I, I, I think someone who didn't share the references you were working with, it doesn't make sense. And that's okay. And, and I think we should say that. Uh, it's bad. I'm not convinced in, hey, see, I believe in God. See, I, 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 again, I, thi I think what you're expressing in your formulation is what I'm expressing in, in completely admitting that there are no proofs that can possibly be summoned with respect to establishing one position versus the other. And indeed, to that extent, the realization that there is a self-referential aspect in both positions is undeniable. What I would, however, nonetheless challenge is the employment of the term absolute in a closed system that pertains exclusively to this world. But, but all of this is fine until this becomes an ethic for my life. So all of the philosophy is fine until this becomes that which I have to adhere to upon the basis of your self-referential 
understanding of this. Th okay, yeah, okay. Th this is where I then began to go, okay, no, I'm not happy. You're actually dehumanizing me by saying my view is not existing by your own theistic. So I don't buy this because I don't buy your fundamental self. That, that's what I'm, I'm just okay. being playful. <laughs> I'm, 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 that, that's an interesting employment of the word playful but let me let me explain what yeah, i mean by okay. this that is, I, I, carry on i'm, uh, I'm happy to I'll back off no uh, oh, that's quite all right as uh, it could be it could be that there are, there may be uh, semantic divergences uh, simply because i don't speak scottish yeah, i think but it, 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 <laughs> just, uh, no, no, no. it might be english language we're struggling with uh, okay <laughs> but, uh, but uh, maybe we'll still return to these yeah, points I, right. please carry on uh, yes I like your, your, your model of three uh, components uh, of, of life, but as any model, it has its limitations. Any schematic and view of anything is limited. Yeah, and now I was wondering, and maybe uh, has to do with the discussion just now, uh, if you uh, trespass the second and the fifth law, and well, well, these components are intertwined. There are a lot of relations between Of course, them as Hank as, as already pointed out, undeniably. Because otherwise, you, if you trespass the second and the fifth one, it doesn't have any relation, any effect in the other three, two uh, uh, components. Well, again, I, I, what, I, what, I would, see, I, what, what I would still state is that, indeed, this is schematization. And as any schematization, it has its limitations. But I think there is merit in establishing this three-way division of what the essential components of life are, and recognizing that among these laws, there is a primary address with respect to one of these pillars as opposed to the other two. And that there is indeed this division of first threesome and second threesome. That's all I'm attempting to establish here. Now, what I do want to stress as con considering further the implications of this division, I, I think this, this will again pertain to the questions that you've raised, is one of the most essential questions that we necessarily confront in grappling with any system that evaluates the question of morality. Namely, is morality something that is autonomous or heteronymous? Is morality something that comes from within, from its own system, or is it specifically a system that is imposed from outside? Now, with respect to the Noahide laws, you may rightly already anticipate whether I would deem them to be autonomous or heteronymous based upon my having already conceded that I can find no explicit statement in scripture that affirms them as such. That is, there are components, as we already noted. But certainly as a corpus, there is no explicit scriptural statement that presents them. And therefore, when we ask, essentially, upon what basis do we invoke them, this is perhaps the most critical theological implication of the very existence of such a corpus of Noahide laws. And that is, that a human being has an innate moral sense that is sufficient grounds to be able to come to these essential bases of moral living. Now, before I elaborate further, I'd like to explain what I mean by this statement in the first place. And this brings me to Genesis chapter 18. Where startling, even revolutionary thesis is presented. And of course, as you can see, the the portion that I, I bold faced in these verses it was indeed intentional in highlighting what I'd like to stress here. This is after God has informed Abraham of the impending doom of Sodom and Gomorrah, of the five cities that have become legendary in their depravity. And in chapter 18, verse 21, 
And Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And of course, the, spe the specifics, peradventure there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep away and not forgive the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? That be far from you. God forfend that you do like that to slay the righteous with the wicked. That the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from you. God forfend that you do such a thing. Shall the judge of all the earth not do justly? Consider the implications of this extraordinary challenge. I think there is a tendency among believers, and perhaps even more so among the derogators of the Bible and of belief in God, to think that we establish a facile equation between what God does and how good is defined. Whatever God does constitutes the good. So we might think, but of course it becomes immediately obvious when one considers Abraham's challenge that the Bible rejects that, pre that premise. Because if indeed that premise were valid, then Abraham could not possibly object to God doing something as being unjust. What do you mean, shall the judge of all the earth not do justly? If God does it, it's justice. If that were indeed the case, then Abraham couldn't have said this. But he does say it. In other words, Abraham is tacitly coming to God and saying, excuse me, I know what justice means, and I don't need to learn it from you. <laughs> and I refuse to acquiesce in your acting in a way that I consider to be unjust. Now, of course, I am perhaps to a degree over-dramatizing this. <laughs> Only to a degree. <laughs> In that, of course, you would be right to say, well, where does Abraham learn what justice is altogether? How does he have that innate sense? And of course, my response to that will inevitably bring us back to, remember this? The way God created man? That is, of course, our response as to the origin of that innate sense of morality, that innate sense of justice that animates Abraham is, that's the way God created Abraham. That's the way God created all of humanity. That we are dowered with that divine essence within us, that divine likeness within us, that not only allows us, but impels us to challenge acts of injustice. So, of course, it comes from God, but it doesn't come from God because of any facile emulation, any mere obedience to that which God says. This is precisely the autonomous morality that results from our perspective from being created with an innate moral sense that enables us to access morality autonomously. Yes? Um, I might be wrong, but uh, sometimes I get the expression that in, for example, Talmud, um, the Amalekites are like uh, imminently murderous, and the Canaanites are imminently um, sexual immoral. Uh, no, I, I have to reject that thesis. Yeah? Okay. That is, uh, I reject it because, first of all, while I agree with you, scripturally, we find that the Canaanites and the Egyptians are described as having acted in a manner of depravity, it's never don't be as them. Rather, what we read in Leviticus chapter 18 is as the actions of, as the deeds of, kema'aseh Eretz Mitzrayim. As the actions, the deeds of the land of Egypt and the deeds, actions of the land of Canaan, you shall not do. In other words, it's not a characterization of what they are, it is rather a realization of what they're doing. And indeed, in this regard, it is um, the, uh, the conclusion in our tradition that the mitzvah, the commandment of extirpation that pertains to the Canaanite nations and to Amalek applies only so long as they have not embraced guess which set of laws? The Noahide laws. That by virtue of embracing the Noahide laws, 
the, um, the, the consequence is they are no longer considered to be part of a depraved system. Rather, they are part of the nations of the world, that generic system that is upholding the Noachide Covenant, and the, the laws of extirpation no longer apply. But there's a little uh, <laughs> story about that God offered uh, Torah to, uh, to the people, or to the Goyim, and he went to the, I, I'm not sure if it were Amalekites, but they rejected this be, because they couldn't, you know, murder anymore. It wasn't yeah. the no. It wasn't the Amalekite. That is yeah, the the, um, the the statement. It is a, indeed a midrashic statement yeah. that pertains to God, respectively, offering the Torah to the sons of Ishmael, who say, "Well, it says in the Torah that um, that His hand is in everything. That is, that theft is part of our legacy. So we can't accept the Torah." that tells you not to steal. Yeah. And um, that God approaches the, uh, the, the children of Esau, Edom, and they say, well, it says in the Torah, you will live by your sword. So a Torah that tells us you shall not murder isn't for us. And God goes to the descendants of Lot, Ammon, and Moab, and they say, well, our very existence we owe to incest, so a, um, a Torah that tells us that we can't engage in sexual immorality just isn't for us. <laughs> yeah, but, but of course, the moral of the story in those instances was they were wrong. What's the proof they were wrong? If they really wouldn't have been able to accept the Torah, then God wouldn't have offered it to them. The, the underlying implication is that God is offering it to them because it is something that they can accept. It is something with which they, with they can resonate. And um, just to steer the discussion back to the Noahide laws, you'll note that all the examples that are presented in this colorful vidrash are drawn from the Noahide laws. In other words, they could not possibly have been right. Because if indeed the underlying premise is that the Noahide laws constitute a system of autonomous morality, it is inconceivable that they were unable to accept them. So yeah. if, they, if they were able, then why didn't they? Ah, answer, at the risk of sounding um, sublimely simple-minded, they didn't want to. <laughs> Not that they couldn't. But we are endowed with free will. They chose not to. Thank you. Yes. I think we should uh, have a break now and uh, proceed after the break with uh, discussing, uh, okay. for example, the uh, relevance of uh, this theory for today in civil rights and government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. And also, yeah. and also, and also, a meeting like this. That's right. But <laughs> I think it's very important because it uh, it reminded me of the famous question that Plato asks. In one of his writings, uh, if um, things are good because God deems that they are good, mm -hmm. or does God deem things good because they are good of themselves? Uh, it's also, yeah, it's the famous question he raises. Uh, and and uh, there's still, there is an autonomous moral obligation in human life. Of course, the, re the, reason, the reason that we are able, in some sense, to circumvent that question, and Plato was not, is because we believe in a creator who endowed us with that moral sense, right. which Plato did not. Exactly. And as, uh, by consequence of that, yeah. we can posit that it is autonomous uh, and ultimately has its source in God. That's right. I mean, yeah. You said that this moral sense is uh, the image of God. Indeed, right. Yeah. That, 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 so that it's, is it's not something external to God, it's himself. Of it course, that's exactly the point. That is, that this, this is the God-likeness that is imprinted in us, yeah. that, that, that enables us to naturally resonate with what is moral, and to naturally recoil from that which is immoral. So, Except, so Abram is not calling to some external form of justice outside of God, he is calling God to be himself. Well, of course, that's true. That's why I was being a little bit overdramatic in my portrayal. <laughs> but, but, um, but the reason for the, um, the, the pr presentation is because it, it certainly negates the facile perception that in our striving to be good, we are simply emulating, yeah. if, if you'll pardon my using a very crass English word here, that we are simply aping God. Mm -hmm. We're not copying God. We are rather resonating with the moral 
sense yeah. that God instilled within us as an innate endowment. Yeah, it's, it's improvisation. Yeah, and, 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 and I should note in this regard, just perhaps as one final observation that I think is particularly germane, that in our tradition, the Noahide covenant, the Noahide laws, don't even require forewarning in order to establish a threshold of culpability. Mm -hmm. Because everyone can know of his or her own what right and wrong is with respect to these laws. The system of the Torah is unequivocally heteronymous. There is no way that one can intuit the mandates and prohibitions of the Torah. The system of the Noachide laws, however, is autonomous. Maybe we'll end on that note, although there's an awful lot more to elaborate with respect to it, so you can uh, air out and we can continue.